Uh, our gracious God, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the challenge uh, to, to be a witness. And may we all do that in these days. So, Lord, now may you uh, help us to clear our minds, clear our thinking, clear our thoughts. Uh, give us ears to hear what you have to say. And may you speak to us through your word for your glory in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 Well, for those who don't know, my name is Michael. Uh, I'm the videographer, photographer, editor, and social media manager here at Zion's Hope. But uh, what I'm doing is a two-part series that I called Antiochus and the Antichrist. Last time we talked about Antiochus, Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes. Today we're going to be focusing on the Antichrist himself. Uh, but I want to remind us of the three things that I want us to remember from this. First of all, the importance of knowing the Bible. So crucial. Second, the importance of knowing history. Because we live in history. History is a part of life. Third, the importance of knowing Bible prophecy, all of which are extremely important. So I just want to do a quick review first, then we'll get into uh, the new topic. Just as a reminder, Antiochus was born in Syria. Uh, he ruled the Seleucid Empire. Uh, his life was prophesied in Daniel 8, of course, hundreds of years before he came onto the scene. Uh, he had some issues or problems with Rome and with Egypt and took out his wrath and his anger on the Jews in Jerusalem and, of course, the temple, too. He broke a commitment that had been established with the Jewish people. Forbade the Jews to follow the law or die, if you remember that. Uh, he slew a pig on the altar in the temple, put a statue of Zeus with his face on it there as well, <coughs> demanding to be worshipped as God. And if you recall last time, too, he died more than likely by a direct intervention of God himself. And we'll see how some of these things parallel with the Antichrist as well. So when it comes to looking at the individual we call the Antichrist, I want to start with just a biblical foundation for this individual, the biblical foundation for the Antichrist. And for that, we're going to be back in Daniel. So if you have your Bibles, I do have some of the, uh, the text up here, uh, but we'll be in Daniel 11 just to start out with. And we'll be looking at different texts today. So we won't stay in one, but we will be in Daniel for a little bit of time. Verses 21 through 35 of Daniel 11 it talks about Antiochus Epiphanes. It talks about him specifically. And I'll read a few of those verses here. Verses 21 and 23 says this. In his place, a despicable person will arise on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred. Remember, Antiochus took it. He took the opportunity when, when he had the opportunity to do that. But he will come into a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. After an alliance is made with him, he will practice deception. And he will go up and gain power with a small force of people. Then skipping down to verses 31 to 32. Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress and do away with the regular sacrifice. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. By smooth words he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. That's of course, remember that a lot of the Jewish people followed him. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. That's the Maccabean revolt. And verse 35 ends with an appointed time for Antiochus. Now there's a lot of individuals, or some individuals rather, who say there's kind of a break between verses 35 and 36, and I do agree with that. I, I do think that's the case. And verses 36 through 45 shift. It changes focus to the future Antichrist, whom we call. Then in chapter 12 of the book of Daniel, more details are given. And we won't go over the verses just as a summary. Michael the archangel is told to stop fighting or stand still. Uh, there's going to be a time of distress or great tribulation. There's going to be a resurrection, but before that there's three and a half years or time, times and a half a time of great destruction for the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. And here's the thing. Daniel did not fully understand this. And I take comfort in that, by the way, because you start studying prophecy, you're like, what in the world is this talking about? So if Daniel didn't understand everything, feel free to be okay if you don't understand it all either. <laughs> so, but he said this, verses 9 through 13. This is the angel speaking. He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. And none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, this is a separate one, there will be 1290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. 
But as for you, go your way to the end, then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. So this, of course, is what's going to happen to Daniel and, of course, a lot of others at that time. Now, here we're introduced to a man who will do some very similar things to Antiochus. There's additional numbers to the three and a half years. You can study that. I know Michael Ufferman's done some wonderful studies on that. But we're going to see that this is the time of the Antichrist. Now, we're going to come back to some of this text in Daniel 11, so keep your fingers there. But I want to first talk about the culture of the Antichrist, the culture of of the Antichrist. We looked at the culture of Antiochus. Now I want to look at this. Because when we look at the culture of the Antichrist, we see corruption. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, 2 Timothy 3, Matthew 24, the book of Revelation, and other texts are very clear. They indicate that the time when the Antichrist arises, it's going to be a time of pagan worship, apostasy, corruption, violence, Apathy, wars, evil, and more. And just as the world was corrupt during the time of Antiochus, so the world, I believe, will be even more corrupt, more so, before the end of the age when Christ returns. And just as there was political intrigue, uh, battles taking place, rumors of wars and things like that, that will also occur during the end of the age before Christ returns and as Daniel 11 states. So don't be shocked when things get worse in the world. Don't be surprised as politicians become more corrupt. Don't be surprised as governments and nations turn their back on God, turn to themselves and to paganism. Don't be surprised. Don't be defeated as things go downhill. Guess what? If you're in Christ and He's in you, we're on the winning side by His grace. Only by His grace. Don't think things are going to get better and that the church is going to get stronger. We're going to bring in God's kingdom. It is not going to happen that way. I'm sorry. Scripture says it's going to get much worse before the return of Jesus. And we need to be prepared. You know, I've spoken about persecution in the church many times. It's still coming. And many places it's already here. Don't think that we can escape or we will escape. But that's going to be the context and the culture of which the Antichrist is going to arise. I mean, we think the world is sick now. It's only getting sicker as time goes on. And the only vaccination is the gospel. Is the gospel. So that's the culture. But now let's look at the life of the Antichrist. Now we know that Antiochus was born in Assyria. And... When you look at biblical history, patterns begin to emerge. You know, like the ninth of Av, destruction of the temple, and many other events have taken place in Jewish history on that date. One pattern, again, is where Antiochus was born and where Antichrist could be born, and that is in Syria. Possible. Micah 5, verses 5 and 6 say this. This one will be our peace when the Assyrian invades our land. When he tramples our citadels, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight leaders of men. And they will shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword in the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And that would, of course, be Babylon. And he will de deliver us from the Assyrian when he attacks our land, when he tramples our territory. Now, go back and read the entire chapter. This is about end times. I mean, we don't have time to go over everything right now. But go back and look at that because it is plausible that the Assyrian is the Antichrist. We see this two times in, this, in these verses here, in this passage. And if Antichrist is born in Syria or that area, it does parallel Antiochus IV. But we also see something else. The Antichrist is going to magnify himself, just as Antiochus did. Look at verses 36 to 39 here in Daniel 11. Then the king will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself, above every god and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods. That's, of course, Yahweh. And he, that is the Antichrist, will prosper in until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. But instead he will honor a god of fortresses, 
a God whom his fathers did not know. So we're actually told what kind of God he's going to worship. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. He will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign God. He will give great honor to those who acknowledge him and will cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for a price. Sounds like a politician, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's part of what he's going to be. But here we have this individual who's going to magnify himself. Now, very much like Antiochus, he's going to do what he wants. He's going to exalt himself, magnify himself above all the gods, which is spoken twice in verses 36 and 37. He's going to blaspheme God, speak monstrous things against the true and living God. We think, how horrible is that? But look around in the world today, just like Antiochus did. He's not going to follow the gods of his fathers. Now, this is actually quite interesting, and there are some parallels here. Antiochus followed some of the gods of his fathers, but also those of Rome. So he kind of had a mixture, a mishmash of some of the beliefs. Remember, Antiochus was in Rome as a prisoner for a period of time. So he learned about their philosophy, learned about their gods, and basically the gods of Rome are the gods of Egypt with just different names when you actually look at it, with a few additions there too. So there's that kind of stew, you know, throw all the gods in one pot and just kind of stir and then create whatever you want kind of thing. He followed the gods of Greece and the Antichrist. He may give lip service to the god or the gods of his Islamic fathers, but in the end reject them. Why? Because he's going to magnify himself above every god just like Antiochus did. And that's what paganism is. I am God. It goes back to the Garden of Eden and the lie that Satan told to Adam and Eve. You shall be as gods. It all goes back to that. And we need to be very careful as individuals and as a church. Because when we magnify ourselves, we are also blaspheming God. Because we're putting ourselves in His place. When we seek what we want, how we want it, when we want it, and how we want it, rather than submitting to Him, we're magnifying ourselves. Who we are, who we think we are. When we reject His word, when we reject His counsel, His leading, His guidance, His rebuke, and His conviction, His love, and His holiness, we are magnifying ourselves. When our security is in our bank account, in our relationships, our job, our position, and more, we are magnifying ourselves. When we bow to the culture and become more like the pagan culture around us, we're magnifying ourselves because we are rejecting God. And we can say, when we say, basically say, I can do only what God can do. I can change that person. I can do this. I can do that. And this is rampant in the body of Christ today. Churches are going their own way, doing their own thing, rather than going to Scripture and going to the Lord and saying, Lord, what pleases you in this? Not how can we look like the culture to supposedly attract more people, but how can we honor you because you are the one we are trying to please, and not other people. So we need to be very careful that we do not magnify ourselves as well. Because we can always point to other people. Oh, look how horrible that person is. Oh, 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 so sad. Well, wait a second. Are there things in our lives that are displeasing to the Lord that we need to deal with? That we need to say, Lord, you are Lord. I am not. I am not. And that can be hard sometimes. That can be very hard sometimes. But he wants us to be humble. Now, this phrase, the desire of women in verse 37, has caused quite a bit of discussion over the years. Uh, it depends on your translation, actually, because it can be translated two different ways. Some translate it desire of women, and some say, well, he's going to be a homosexual. I don't think that's really the best way to look at it, because it can also be translated desired by women. What's that mean? The object of desire probably referring to the God or gods desired by women. And there was a historical context to Antiochus and everything too. And that he's going to reject those gods too, and I think that fits better with the context. 
Because it's very strange to think, okay, he's rejecting all these gods, he's going to be homosexual, he's rejecting all these gods. It, it just doesn't fit with the context. But you can do some more study on that. I'll let you do that in your own time. But we also find out he's going to serve a false god. Verse 38 says, the god he's going to honor is a god of fortresses. Now, what is that talking about? What does that mean? It's, it is mysterious. The Hebrew words can refer to a place or a means of safety and protection. That's what a fortress is, a place where you're safe. And here, a place of protection basically under a heathen or a pagan god, a false deity. He's going to honor this guy with riches and more than likely in an attempt to appease them and get on their good side because that's what paganism is. If you know anything about you know, Hinduism or Buddhism or ancestor worship in other cultures, what do you do? You take money, you take food to a shrine or outside, you burn the money or you do this or you do that to try to appease the spirits to get on their good side so they don't get you. It's fear. It's fear and it's very sad. But more than likely, what this is referring to is that he sets himself up as God because he's empowered by Satan, which we'll look at in a minute, because he himself actually worships Satan. And here's what's going to happen. And just, just follow with me on this. And with this false God's help, Satan's help, he goes against the strongest of these fortifications or fortresses. And again, this is mysterious. We're not, it, it, it could be a couple of many different things. But I do believe it's going to become clearer in the end what this is talking about. But it is similar to Antiochus. Why? He honored the gods of Greece as well as those of Rome. He was influenced by Roman thought, which involved the gods, again, taken from the Greek pantheon, but he modified them. He changed it. And ultimately, Antiochus served Satan. He set himself up as God, demanding to be worshipped. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And Antichrist will also serve Satan and be empowered by Satan. Number four, and this is very sad, many will follow him. Many will follow the Antichrist because the same thing happened with Antiochus. Verse 39 says that he's going to be, he's going to be able to give great honor to those who follow him and give them rule, which means he has authority and power to do so. He's going to give a portion to, of land to those who follow him and those whom he chooses. Again, showing, showing his authority here. And he promises great blessing to those who follow him. Now, does, isn't that what every leader says? Follow me and you'll be blessed. Yeah. Hey, vote me in and I'll give you what you want. You'll get free everything. <laughs> Still don't see how that works. And by the way, for those who don't know, I did a, a message last year on uh, socialism, Babylon, and the end times. I would encourage you to, to watch that if you have that. It is up on our, our, our website, on our YouTube channel. But many are going to follow him. And this also may indicate he has sub-leaders, sub-groups within uh, his regime, as it were. And they are going to be doing his bidding locally. And this, again, is what happened with Antiochus. Remember, as I mentioned last time, that there were statues of Antiochus that were taken around to different places and people were called to worship those images. Remember that? Antiochus didn't do that. He had his henchmen <laughs> to do it, basically. And more than likely, Antichrist's henchmen are going to do something very similar. And we'll see some of this in Revelation 13 here in just a little bit. To make sure his bidding is done, and very sadly, once again, paralleling Antiochus, many Jews are going to follow the Antichrist. And that's very sad. And then Daniel 11, 40 through 45, give additional details about other end times events, wars, rumors of wars, things like that, and battles that are going to take place, which you can study again on your own time. But here's where it gets interesting. Number five, he will be empowered by Satan. I've said that a few times already, but now we're going to look at some texts that actually state that. Revelation 13, 1 through 8, and the dragon, Satan, stood on the sand of the seashore, then I saw a beast coming out of the sea, the nations, having ten horns, seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, ten crowns. And on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And of course, this is the conglomeration of empires with a leader or a king within each. 
And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. There it is. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and what followed after the beast. So much so, verse 4, they worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? There was given a mouth to him speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months. Daniel 12, 11, three and a half years as given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is those who dwell in heaven. Interesting little phrase there. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. Just so you get that, small, medium, large, larger, tribe, people, tongue, nation, was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone, here's the qualification, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Wow. So this individual is going to be empowered by Satan himself. And I look at it this way. When there is such hatred towards the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, and Christians, there is only one way to describe it. It is satanic. It is the spiritual battle that we are in every single day of our lives. Paul says he's going to be empowered by Satan in 2 Thessalonians 2. We'll see that in just a few minutes. But we do see a historical example of this in the man Hitler. How many of you have ever studied anything about World War II or Hitler, the Nazi regime, the Reich, Third Reich? It is uh, quite eye-opening and, and scary when you really study some of this stuff. Uh, Erwin Lutz has written some great books. We have some of those downstairs. I would encourage you to get those. And while it is, a, while it is possible that Antiochus was empowered by Satan, we know that Hitler was. Very much so. When he gave his speeches, they were impassioned. People were mesmerized at his words, at his speech, and they would just stand in awe of this individual. It's also recorded that after he was done, he would collapse in exhaustion. Very common from after being possessed and doing stuff like that. And what most people don't know is the Nazis were deeply involved in the occult, big time. And this was part of it. And I also believe the Antichrist will be deeply involved in the occult as well. So that's kind of the life of the Antichrist. Now let's look at the abomination of desolation and end of the Antichrist for just a little bit. Now we first read about the abomination of desolation of the Antichrist in Daniel 12, 11. Jesus refers to this event in Matthew 24, 15. He says, you know, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And again, I think that phrase is extremely important right there at the end. And, and there are those who will say, well, you know, everything in, in Daniel is talking about, you know, Antiochus and then 70 AD maybe and all this other stuff. It doesn't fit with what Jesus himself is saying here. It can't be just Antiochus. And remember, there's a pattern in Jewish thinking and Jewish history when it comes to these kinds of events. It can happen more than once, and it has. And because some say that, well, you know, what Jesus is talking about is AD 70, the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem and all this thing. And while there were unique events that did surround the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and while it does picture events at the end of the age, there are details that just don't fit at all. They don't fit within the Olivet Discourse or anything like that. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians 2 do not fit with 70 AD, which is actually what we come to right now. So remember, we're talking about the abomination of desolation here. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed, either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Because there were some in that day that thought, oh, God's judgment is here. Paul says, no, 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 no. Hold on, guys. Let no one in any way deceive you. That's a great phrase for today, by the way. For it, the day of the Lord, will not come unless two things happen first. The apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. 
the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, which we just read in Daniel, we just read in other places there too, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God, just like Antiochus did. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? <laughs> I would have loved to have sat there and listened to what Paul was talking about. To hear him teach prophecy, wow, wow, that would have been great. I'm sure I would have been like, huh? <laughs> Verse 6, And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. That is, even though there's a man coming, this is still, this is going on now, guys. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Again, that's Michael the archangel. Then, then, time marker, then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of who? Satan. Satan. With all power and signs and false wonders. Can God do miracles? Yeah, absolutely. Satan does false miracles. And with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Verse 11, for this reason, because of these things, God will send them a strong deluding influence or de delusion so that they will believe what is false. It's God's judgment. In order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. So this is the same time frame. This is also talking about the culture of the Antichrist and what's going to be happening at that time. So, when we look at this, there's a lot said about the Antichrist, of course, and there are some who would say, well, this refers to Nero. But here's a problem. Nero didn't go to Jerusalem in 70 AD. He was dead already. He died in 68. And again, some events in 70 AD do parallel in times events. But Paul says there's a, still this future man of lawlessness, this son of destruction or son of perdition, depending upon your translation. And when it says son of... It's talking about the character qualities of that individual. That's his life. That's who he is. He's a deceiver. He's one who brings destruction. And he will have destruction, of course, poured upon him in the end. John calls him the Antichrist. 1 John 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Hmm. Now, when it comes to his names and titles, they tell us about his character of the Antichrist. Again, you can do more study on that. But just as a reminder, anti means two things, in place of and against. Someone putting themselves in the position of Christ, but someone who is also against Christ. And it kind of goes hand in hand when you really think about it. And if you remember... During the time of Antiochus IV, there was a promise of peace in place. Antiochus III had given special privileges to the Jewish community for their help, remember? And before Antiochus set up the abomination of desolation in his day, the Seleucid Empire and the Jewish nation, they got along pretty well at that time. But Antiochus broke the agreement, he broke the covenant, so to speak as Daniel 9 says the Antichrist is going to do. So let's look at Daniel 9 for just a moment. You've heard this many, many times, but I just want to focus on a couple things. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city, Israel, Jerusalem, to finish a transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, probably the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again. The walls, Israel, Jerusalem will be, or Jerusalem will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come, future, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. That is, Daniel, this is going to happen. And he, who is the he? The people of the prince who is to come. And he 
will make a firm covenant with many for one week, seven years. But in the middle of the week, what's, what's the middle of seven years? Three and a half. Good. Good. Little math quiz there. I just want to just, it's just 42, yep, 42 months. He will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even unto complete destruction, one that is decreed. We see this over and over again. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So when we look at this, again, we see these parallels. This text says that he's going to create a covenant or an agreement of some kind. Now, this may be a new one. This may be a reaffirm one that's already in place. Could be either way. And it is assumed to be an agreement of peace, which is going to be broken, which I think is probably accurate. Because what is the one thing that Israel wants most of all? Peace. I mean, if you lived in a tent surrounded by wolves that wanted to eat you and destroy you, what would you want? Peace with those wolves. You would want something to say, okay, wolves, stay away. Don't eat me. <laughs> and that's what Israel is right now. They're in the midst of a wolf, wolves rather, that want to destroy them and eat them. So he's going to break this covenant, this agreement, halfway through Daniel's 70th week, that seven-year period, at the end of the age. The Antichrist is going to set up the abomination of desolation in the temple in Jerusalem. But what does that mean? Well, that means some kind of structure has to be there for the sacrifices to already be in place before he can do this. So the Antichrist, like Antiochus, is going to stop the sacrifices, set up some kind of image or have an image set up of him, and demand they sacrifice to him, demand they worship him. And Revelation 13 also talks about this as well. Verses 11 through 17. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Hmm. Who do you think that is? He exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence. Here we have the false prophet, by the way, in case, in case you're wondering. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. The false prophet is pointing to the Antichrist. He's the man. Follow him. He's the man. Worship him. He's the man. Do what he says. Whose fatal wound was healed. He, the false prophet, performs great signs so that even, he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Be very careful when it comes to the hype surrounding miracles. Be very careful. Verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth, make an image to the beast who had the, wound of the, who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him, the false prophet again, to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. What did Antiochus do? You don't bow down to me, you don't worship this, you're dead. Verse 16, and he, that is a false prophet, causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and slaves, to be given a mark on the right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. It has to be a physical mark of some kind, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And of course, we know that that's uh, 666, although some, one of a few early manuscripts say 616. But when we compare scripture with scripture, there is going to be an image in the Jewish temple. And it seems there's going to be additional images that are going to be created that people are going to be called to worship. Again, this happened during the reign of Antiochus. And it will happen again. Now, you say, well, what's the image going to be? What's it going to look like? We're not told. We're not told what it is. We're not told what it looks like. We can only speculate right now until that time comes. But as the abomination of desolation happened historically, it will happen again. But the Antichrist, just like Antiochus, is going to be judged by God. And that brings us to Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast 
was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive, which again, they have to be literal people, were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. The end of the Antichrist and the false prophet, judged specifically by God by being thrown alive into the lake of fire. Now, as we finish up, I just want to summarize some of these things. Antiochus Epiphanes was a historical individual who foreshadows a future individual we call the Antichrist. Just as a reminder, here's a few things. Antiochus was born in Syria. Scripture indicates that Antichrist will also come from that area, not Rome. Antiochus broke a treaty that was in place, and the Antichrist will initiate one and then break it. Antiochus had problems with Egypt and other places, other nations. And the Antichrist will have political problems with some of the same areas and more. Go back and read Ezekiel and Daniel and things like that. Antiochus set up an image of himself in the temple of Jerusalem, remember with his face on it, and demanded to be worshipped and have sacrifices offered to him. Antichrist will have an image of himself set up in a temple structure of some kind in Jerusalem and demand to be worshipped, just like Antiochus did. Now, he may demand that the world offer sacrifices to him, too. That's possible. Antiochus forbade the observance of the law, and, and the Antichrist will do the same thing. There were additional images of Antiochus that were to be worshipped. Again, and Antichrist will do the same. And I believe the hatred of Antiochus was satanic, who took out his anger and wrath against the Jews because he didn't get what he wanted. And the Antichrist will be empowered by Satan who will also take out his wrath on the Jews and the Christians who will be alive at that time during what we call the Great Tribulation. Antiochus was a smooth and deceptive talker. He was not a fool. And I believe the Antichrist is going to be the same. Antiochus was judged by God, and the Antichrist will also be judged by God. So there are many parallels between these two individuals, and a lot of other things could be studied and texts could be mentioned. And there are some things that are a mystery to us today, but as time goes on, there will be a man who rises to power over in the Middle East, primarily. We may or may not know it at first, because... Again, he won't be revealed until halfway through Daniel's 70th week. And I do believe Islam will be part of this, along with the occult. Because they're all pagan religions. Anything not in Scripture is a false religion, a false belief, based in the character of Satan and deception that he has made. I know that's not popular, but that's the truth. And while Antichrist may feign allegiance to Islam and other beliefs because things are kind of merging and melding again together. His real master is Satan. Don't be deceived. He be, will be revealed halfway through the seven-year period of Daniel's 70th week and exposed for what he is, that is, for those who understand the truth of what God's Word says. We will understand this guy is demonic. When he sets up an image of himself and demands to be worshipped. And here's the thing, the world will follow him. And the challenge for us was to be the exact opposite of the world. I want to end with a couple things here. This was a, a challenge given by a pastor years ago where my mom and dad were going to church. He said this, name three doctrines and defend them from Scripture. Can you do that? Can you name three biblical core doctrines of the faith and defend them from this book? If not, I challenge you to be able to do that. Wherever church you go to, whether it's a large church or a small church, be involved in discipleship. You know, Bible study classes are great. Uh, mentorship, take classes, take courses. Be equipped with God's truth to share but also to live in our own lives. Talk to your pastor. Hey. What kind of discipleship courses are we thinking about doing in the future? 
and what kind of training can I get involved with where I'm not just learning something, but I'm going out and being active and doing something too? Because don't think for a moment the church is going to escape Antichrist persecution because we are not. Be aware and also be aware of the increasing paganism in society and also in the church. It is happening. Study scripture, know the truth, share the truth with others, and don't just learn about the end times. Share what you learn with other people, even if they don't listen. Share what you learn. And remember that studying these topics, going over these things, should lead us to live a life that is honoring to the Lord. That's what Peter says. What manner of life should you ought to live knowing these things are coming? Being aware of these things. It should change our life, not just make our head bigger. It should make our hearts bigger as well. And we also need to go out because of the urgency of the time to share the gospel and make disciples of all nations while there is still time. Let's pray and close. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is clear. And while there are things, of course, that we don't understand, pieces of the puzzle that we may not be able to fit right now, give us an awareness of current events. Help us to be aware of what's going on in the world, particularly over in Israel. But Lord, let us study your word, study to show ourselves approved unto you, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So Lord, fill us with your spirit. Give us the boldness to share Christ. Give us the boldness to stand against culture when they go awry and when it continues to go awry. And let us follow you faithfully. May you teach us, may you speak to us now in the areas where we need to grow, where we need to mature, or even go out and share Christ with other people. We thank you, we love you, we do praise you, and commit all this to you in the wonderful, matchless, mighty name of Jesus, our soon coming King, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who will judge in the end. For his glory we ask. Amen. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.